So there's a handout also coming around. Yes, well, uh, I've, uh, in a sense, I've always been between two cultures in the sense that I've started here as a classicist and ended up as an archaeologist. And I've observed in my years giving talks that uh, there's a kind of different etiquette of seminars in classics and in archaeology. And archaeology prefer, archaeology can prefer stuff and images, and classicists like handouts <laughs> with texts on them. So I thought I'd try to combine the two in this talk and have you know, the, the materiality and so far as we, I know that uh, Anne uh, and Marie will talk, that that's, the, that's the wrong word, but uh, the, the kind of, that kind of perspective that looks at the stuff and another kind of perspective that looks at, uh, that looks at the things as texts. I think James has just introduced himself effectively, hasn't he? James, carry on. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> okay, I, I just hope I can operate this correctly. Right, okay. So the, so the subject of my paper is here, why meh? And meh, for those of you who can't read ancient Greek, is just ancient Greek for me in the accusative. Um, uh, and it's more or less the same, except it has a short e and a long e, as in English, because it's an Indo-European language. And uh, that's what it's all about. Personhood and agency in Greek inscriptions between 800 and 500 BCE, 800 and 550 BCE, so in the middle of the 6th century BCE. So, the Archaeological Museum in Poros is not much visited. If you know where Poros is, Poros is a, is, a, is a kind of small island on the other side, opposite Athens, on the other side of the Saronic Gulf. In summer, the harbours and jetties are crowded with yachts on their way from Athens to Egina, to Poros, to Hydra, and then to Spetses, full of very rich people on their yachts. Few, however, stop to go to the museum. If you do, is this it's the big one in the middle? It's good one in the one on the top. Is the point. If you do, you may very well miss this stone, which is hiding in a corner. Um, the letters are very hard to read, and the stone itself, volcanic trachyte, very unsuitable for an inscription. It does not le aid legibility, or at least our notions of legibility, that the, the letters are inscribed with Ustrophedon, that's to say, as the ox plows back and forth. And this reads, Eumares, father of Androcles, made me and set me up here as a sign and to be memorial to his dear son. That's a kind of way of translating it. Now, one way, the usual way of interpreting this is as a gravestone, a gravestone, grabbing shrift or grab shrift, an object that commemorates a person, Androcles, who has died and been set up by another person, Eumaris. It was found on the Methana Peninsula, and there is a kind of, to, it's there to perpetuate the memory of Androcles. Well, that's certainly one way of looking at it, one dimension of its function, or perhaps we should say its agency. For what is, to modern ears and eyes at least, striking is that not one, but three persons are brought together in this stone and in the inscription. First, the father, Eumades, who caused this stone to be inscribed. Second, his son, whom this inscription commemorates. And third, the stone itself, and it's the stone oh, that speaks to us. Or to put it another way, there is a trinity of persons bound together by this inscribed stone. It is these two features of the inscribed stone, that it acts and so has agency, and acts as if it were a person, that I wish to explore in this paper. The terms agency and personhood are, however, theoretical terms, and I was assuming this is going to be ordered in order to classicists, so um, since classes, classics, generally speaking, you don't Again, there's a, there's a kind of etiquette. You don't really talk about theory. Um, you assume that you know it, but you don't actually talk about it. Um, and classical archaeology in its traditional form is reluctant to talk about theory. Um, and it's been averse to theory, or at least averse to the explicit exposition of theoretical assumptions that underpin the scholarly practices of both classics and classical archaeology. So I'm going to explain these terms. <coughs> Now, the word agency has been used quite a lot in this conference, uh, and it has many uses. I'm not going to say those uses are wrong, 
But I might, what the use I'm going to prefer is that of Alfred Gell in his classic 1998 book, Art and Agency. And in Gell's view, it is not only animate person, but animate things that can possess a power to act, and indeed can be held responsible for their actions. Both animals and thing, things can be treated as agents. So these are his, some of his um, best known examples. So this prow of a Trogbian island canoe, he uses that as an example. The one I know slightly better is this um, uh, Congo nail fetish, which is, if you looked at it aesthetically, would be misinterpreted. Uh, you might think this guy is being tortured, but that's not the point of this thing. This is a judicial statue, and the nails represent um, agreements that people have made that, you know, I'm going to do this, and we're going to abide by this agreement, and if we break the agreement, he's going to get you. That's what's going on in this particular um, uh, object. Humans, in many cultures, have a tendency to treat things, things that are normal, more rational moments known to be inanimate, as if they were persons, that is, as animate. So things can act, and act both benevolently and malevolently. So for people of my generation, a good example of this, and I thought about putting this on, was of course, this was the famous scene in the Fawlty Towers, where uh, Basil Fawlty beats his car, because his car has broken down, and that's stopped him from doing what he did, because he's punishing the car for acting malevolently towards him. Now, I, and we've all had these moments, I think. <laughs> Humans, animals, and things are then caught up in webs of agency such that things can be treated either as extensions of a person, what Gell calls the distributed person, but also as persons in their own right, as in the example of our gravestone. Agency is thus logically and inevitably linked to personhood, another term uh, I'm going to now try to explain. Now, personhood is a bit more complex, not because the term itself is more complex, but because there are two separate personhood debates which haven't talked to each other. Again, talking about the uh, different kind of webs of discourse we're involved in. The best known stems from anthropology and arose in the discussion of Melanesian persons. And the most famous quote is this by um, Marilyn Strathern. Uh, the issue was raised by her, and she distinguished between Euro-American Westerners, on the one hand, who are individuals or act individually, and uh, Melanesian individuals who act uh, as parts of a social network. So far from being regarded as unique entities, Melanesian persons are as individually as they are individually conceived. They contain a generalized sociality within. Indeed, persons are frequently constructed as the plural and composite side of the relationship that produce them. The singular person can be imagined as a social microcosm. That's in the gender gift in 1988. Now, of course, we need to exercise a certain amount of caution here. Strathern is not quite saying, but she has often been taken as saying, that these two persons, so here's some two actual persons here. Uh, we have two young people from Papua New Guinea uh, who got a scholarship in uh, Australian University. She's not saying that uh, are always individuals. Um, there's a very good critique of this notion that Melanesians are always individuals and Westerners are always individuals by the anthropologist Edward Lee Puma. And personhood is partly performative. In a Melanesian setting, the dimension of personhood that matters is that of the individual. But these two young people here are perfectly able to function as individuals in a kind of Australian academic setting. Individual, individual does not form an ontological divide between Westerners on the one hand and other sort of strange people elsewhere on the other. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that. Nonetheless, Strathern's kind of original sense of personhood was taken up enthusiastically by <coughs> British prehistorians, in particular by Chris Fowler um, and British prehistorians thought they could detect individuals in the archaeological record, in particular looking at uh, grave deposits such as grave deposits at Wayland Smithy or West Kennet Long Barrow, where bones are sorted not you know, 
You've got all the male skulls in one chamber and all the sort of bones from fit women and long bones from women in another chamber. So people are sorted out and sort of distributed in that way. And we also have other examples where uh, you have a, an apparently individual skeleton that's composed of the, the bones of um, different people. So this concept of personhood, that uh, in the past, in prehistory, people are more likely to be individuals than anything else, was taken up. So these are more likely to be viewed as a collective, socially defined individuals, rather than as bound to discrete individuals. So that's this reason that the main, the most sort of best known book on personhood has been written by Chris Prowler, a British prehistorian. Now that's one debate about personhood that's developed within anthropology and prehistoric archaeology. But before that, there was another debate about personhood. Now, I, I guess I'm going to digress here. <laughs> we know this chap. He's familiar to all of us. And this, is, this was his uh, answer to a question from a journalist from the Guardian newspaper back in 2011. And he was asked well, if he found it difficult, and this is when he was still mayor of London rather than had the power to mess up everybody else's life in quite the same way he's had since. He said, Do you find it being difficult being, being mayor of London? His reply was, which um, means is a quote from the Odyssey, and it's where Odysseus is just comes back on Ithaca and he's in rags, and he's in a big mess, and he's washed up on the shore, and uh, he says, bear up, my heart. You've suffered more dog-like things in the past, these worse things in the past. You know, once upon a time, you were in Polyphemus's cave and just about to be eaten. You know, you're slightly better off than that. Which is a clever answer to the question of the Guardian journalist. But also, um, the point of this anecdote is also to draw your attention to the fact that uh, very often Homeric heroes or persons in Homer do not talk about themselves. They talk about bits of them. In this case, the cradio, the heart. And they often talk about the liver, or they'll refer to the liver as a seat of the emotions and so forth. They don't really talk about themselves as wholes. Um, and this brings us back to um, the great classical scholar E.R. Dodds, who wrote a book called The Greeks and the Irrational back in the 1940s, I think. Uh, and one of the things he was also trying to explain was um, uh, Agamemnon's apology. Now, if you know the plot of the Iliad, you know that it starts off by Agamemnon. Agamemnon uh, loses his mistress, so he goes off and seizes Achilles' his mistress. So he's going to take her. And Achilles goes into a long sulk. The Greek army loses out to the Trojans. And eventually, Agamemnon has to sort of make recompense and apologise. But the thing is, he doesn't really apologise. He says... I was not responsible. I was not responsible. Um, uh, it, was a, it was a sudden madness sent by Zeus that came into me and made me do it. So again, this is not the, these are not the actions of a morally responsible, morally autonomous individual in any sense. These are the actions of perhaps we might say some kind of individual in an anthropological sense. That the person is not necessarily conceived as the principal locus of agency and responsibility is also indicated by another façon de parler, shown in this slide, the tempi, so I've talked about that. In a similar vein, and a similar time, Bruno Snell, about the same time, uh, so uh, we have uh, E.R. Dodds in Oxford, and then we have Bruno Snell, I think, in Hamburg, uh, noticed that early representations of the body, so things like this, in uh, 8th century art, not so much representations of the body as a totality, but an assemblage of parts. An assemblage of parts, moreover, were objects we would regard as external to our body. Shields were as significant as our own limbs, torso, and head. Both Dodds and Stamp then realised that what we might call personhood in early Greece was quite distinct from our notions of the individual. What is all this to do with inscriptions, you may well ask? <coughs> well, this tendency of early Greek inscriptions to speak to us in the first person 
as in the first example, uh, is very widespread. It is not, as, as far as I can tell, and uh, Christopher can correct me there, a major feature of early Phoenician or West Semitic inscriptions of when Christopher was speaking of, of first he talked about Mesha, the only inscription that sort of said I am was Mesha. There are a few other examples, but not very many. The category of inscribed objects that speak to us in the first person have been termed oggetti parlanti, using the Italian phrase, and they're very common in the 8th and 7th century BC. So here we have some examples. So we have um, I am a cup of Tharios, I am a cup of Corax here inscriptions incised on the surfaces of pots, and which refer to the object they're incised on. And classical scholars are very familiar with this, I think too familiar, they just got used to it and they don't really think about it. And this feature of um, writing is very persistent. I'll be looking at examples from Methoni and so forth later. It's most famously found on this thing, so-called Nestor's Cup from Pithecusa, which again all classical scholars I think are fairly familiar with, which starts off by saying, I am the cup of Nestor. Um, and if again you know the Iliad, the cup of Nestor and the Iliad is a very elaborate uh, metal vessel, and this is not an elaborate metal vessel, it's a rather sort of mundane, East Greek, not Rhodian, cup, which is inscribed. Now this inscription also underpins a major theory about the why the Greek alphabet was adopted, and that is that it was adopted, according to Barry Powell and other people, specifically to transcribe Homeric epic verse. Uh, and this is always the sort of case that's brought in to support this particular notion. But I think what I want to draw attention to more here is the fact that it's a joke, and uh, that many jokes like this persist in other examples. Now this is um, this is the Lekithos of Tate. I've um, <coughs> for about since 2008 we've been taking stu our kind of students on a tr on trips to the British Museum where we give them a number of objects to look at uh, and there are about sort of 20 or 30 objects that they get to handle. This one is the persistent favourite. This is related to a seminar where they're asked, you know, pick an object, describe it, why it interests you, and then tell us if it's art or not, and why it might or not be art. So they don't pick the things that are clearly art, they pick this. It's a persistent feature of, I don't know why Cardiff students pick this object, but they really like it. And it says, and the inscription is wrapped around this little lekythos, I am the Lekithos of Tatier. Whoever steals me will be struck blind. Which again, it must be a joke because it's so small. This big. Can't contain that much perfumed olive oil. The idea that, if you know, it's a terrible thing to someone to steal it. So again, it's, a, it's one of these early jokes where the inscription is bound up with the object. And this <coughs> pattern we find in early dedications. So these are two. 7th century dedications from Delos. If you go to the museum here, the museum cast gallery, you'll see a cast of Nicandre, and you'll see in red outlined the inscription that's along the side here. So Nicandre dedicated me, and Euthy Days dedicated me, say two dedications from uh, Delos in the 7th century, a bit later. In the 6th century, uh, this is the famous Geneleos group from the Herion of Samos. Uh, here we have several sculptures grouped together, and we have two inscriptions. Some say, Archis dedicated us, and then Geneleos made us, so speaking as a kind of collective thing. Other famous examples, this is probably the most famous example, uh, I am Prasiclea. Now, if you had watched um, that uh, great programme on civilizations chaired by Mary Beard, she talked about the sculpture, she didn't talk about the inscription, but you can't actually, these two things are inseparable. 
Um, you cannot understand what's going on with this particular sculpture without also reading the inscription. Uh, and it says, I am the sign of Frasiclea. I will be called a Cori forever, taking this name from the gods in place of marriage, which is a poem on the bottom. And this refers back to some of the imagery you actually find on this particular statue. So you can't actually separate the art from the inscription. The, the things are bound up together in, in an inextricable way. And when we come to painted pottery, it's very common to have this kind of inscription, Amasis me poison, Amasis made me, and so on and so forth. And this brings me to another use of the concept of personhood, where um, we can also use it to understand, I think, who were these painters who were painting these pots, so a not the Amasis painter and so forth, I think. And they're not necessarily individuals, or, or uh, because this is a famous quote from Beasley, who has much in common with the Heidelberg painter, surpassing him, however, in all respects, the good deal also of Kleitias, as if painters took on parts of other painters. Speaking objects then are a persistent and long lasting feature of the earliest uses of the Greek alphabet. And these inscriptions do not exist or cannot function independently as texts but only work when mutually entangled with particular things and particular people. They represent a particular form of human thing entanglement in Hodder's sense. And this character is very characteristic of much of early Greece. The new script then made it possible, or made it much easier, to treat objects as persons. And I think that's part of the point about why it was invented or adopted from the Phoenicians. And the, Phoeni and the, the Greeks were quite explicit that Writing is a human invention. They did not, as many other, we had examples of um, new scripts being thought of as coming from a god. These Greeks didn't think that. Um, this is a human invention. They explicitly borrowed it from the Phoenicians. And just I'll have a quick look at some other early deposits uh, from early Greece. These have come to light recently. There's the um, Methoni, Mount Hermetus, Eretria, Sanctuary of Apollo, Daphne Forest, and uh, Comos. These are some relatively recent finds. Now, starting off with the inscriptions from Eretria, no, starting off with the inscriptions from Methoni, we have quite a lot of them, and the two of them are then these cups. So, I am the uh, cup of Philion, I am of Philion, and I am of Hakisandros, there. So again, this pattern you see it before. The, some, some of the finds from Eretria are harder to decipher. There's this one Semitic inscription, which I think was referred to in an earlier paper. Uh, but at least two of them seem to be speaking objects. And again, they're on the handout. The 8th to 7th century, I don't have a slide of the 8th to 7th century inscriptions from Mount Hymettus, but again, at least three of them, two of them say, I am of Zeus, and one says, uh, someone wrote me. And there are these inscriptions from Comos in Crete. And again, at least two of these, usually they're too short to work out what they're saying, but two of these um, say, one says, I am of Nicagoras, and why am I am of someone ending in Adas. Now, that one of the reasons for the adoption of the alphabet was to personify objects is, of course, a suggestion that goes against some of the major theories that have been put forward concerning the origins of the alphabet. First amongst these is the, uh, the economy of signs and the addition of vowels allowed writing to transcribe first poetry <coughs> in particular and speech in general. So there's a direct, there's supposed to be a direct relationship between phoneme and grapheme. There is also the suggestion in people like Havelock, Gideon Watt and so forth, that because the consequence of the introduction of such a script was the widening of literacy, far beyond the scribal class, that too must have been the reason for its adoption. I'm not saying these theories are completely wrong, but they tend to confound causes from consequences. It is, moreover, a fundamental problem with these long-standing explanations that they have emerged from within classical studies. Let me explain why that is a fundamental problem. Now, I'm going to be the second um, speaker in this conference who refers to the 
Gospel of St. John. In the beginning was the Word. These are the first lines of the Gospel of John, also encapsulate the logocentric assumptions that have underpinned debates about the origins of the Greek alphabet. These debates have been primarily philological, concerning the fitness of purpose of various varieties of Greek script accurately to convey and transcribe the phonetic values of the Greek language. As well as being inherently logocentric, they also demonstrate a kind of institutional preference for glottocentric explanations. Speech comes first and writing second, and the utility of any particular script can be evaluated in these terms. As uh, the Akdemida demonstrated, this assumption goes back to Plato and keeps on cropping up in uh, various forms of philosophy, including you know, recent works by Slavoj Žižek. Plato frequently makes the analogy between the elements of sound, the letters of the alphabet, so it informs some, many of his dialogues, it being assumed that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between phonemes and letters. The origins of the alphabet and what this implies about logocentric explanations for symbolic systems in general is therefore an issue that is as much philosophical as empirical. In this paper, I tried to construct an argument based on different non-logocentric principles, principles which are more archaeological, anthropological than philological. I'm not arguing against the notion that the most distinctive feature of the Greek alphabet was its economy of signs, but I am arguing against the notion that these were the sole or even primary motivations for the earliest inventors, experimenters, and users of this new technology of the intellect. As several papers in this conference have pointed out, there is often an embarrassment of riches in early scripts in the early stages of the appearance of literate cultures. Middle Bronze Age, that's the, if you really insist, Middle Minoan Crete, now boasts four scripts or script-like symbolic systems, so-called hieroglyphic, so-called arcane script, linear A, and the script, or whatever it is, of the Phaistos disc. Similarly, as we had in an earlier paper, Ogham and Latin scripts coexisted with socially significant icon-based semiotic systems such as the Pictish symbols in many parts of northern and western Britain during the post-Roman period. The early Greek case is, in fact, similar. For the alphabet appeared around 800 BCE when the geometric style of pottery was still dominant throughout much of the Aegean. Now, this style of pottery is in some ways a symbolic system not completely unlike picture symbol stones. Things like this are found, these kinds of symbols are found on high status graves, in this case, high status grave of a man if you had a belly handle lamp for a high status grave of a woman. And throughout the Aegean world, but particularly in Attica and areas around it, this sort of circling cross motif. That so many early inscriptions were inscribed on pots is not simply therefore a function of ceramics providing a common and convenient surface for inscriptions. A recent article by... <coughs> Sorry. Stop going forward. A recent article by Binak draws attention to this interaction between geometrical principles of design and the quasi-geometric aesthetics of the inscription on Dipalon Inoku, which is another early inscription. It doesn't say meh, but uh, this is deliberately drawn around the top, just above the geometric decoration. The two seams seem to be go together. That image and inscription <coughs> develop a symbiotic relationship in narrative scenes on later Greek painted pottery is perhaps something we need to explore further with all the theoretical resources in the armory of archaeology and anthropology. Part of the explanation for this symbiosis must, I think, require the uses of concepts of agency and personhood. Thank you.